Hello, everybody, and welcome to Hike and Draw. This is the Nature Drawing Workshop, and together we're going to be celebrating World Oceans Week. Uh, despite the photo in the background, it's not an ocean scene, but we're going to be working on some ocean subjects today together. If it's your first time, welcome. So happy to meet you. My name is James Sisti. I'm a professional artist and a wilderness guide, and today I have the pleasure and privilege of being your instructor. I know we only have 90 minutes, but we can accomplish a lot in that time frame. We're going to be going through a couple of the basics with uh, just a little discussion on nature drawing in general. We're going to talk about the gear we're using today, the kit, and uh, we're also going to be doing a little warm up exercise together. And I'll explain the whole process that we uh, teach here at Hike and Draw. Then after that, we're going to do some wildlife drawing and then we're going to be um, pretty much doing that for the rest of the class. And then we'll end with some notes on sharing your work and developing your practice further. So when we talk about nature drawing, the whole point of it isn't to make pretty pictures, right? You don't have to be an artist to get the benefit of nature drawing. It's kind of like um, a tool and it's a tool that you use to build both intention and focus while you're out in nature. It's so easy to get distracted, honestly. If you're a hiker, you definitely know this between the phones, between over chatty trail companions, or even um, confusing maps, you can walk right past something outstandingly interesting and not even realize it. So the whole point of nature drawing again is to kind of build a deeper connection with nature and to kind of force yourself to focus. It's like playing a little trick on your brain, even though you may not be drawing the best thing in the world, by simply drawing, you're paying very, close attention to the subject and that way you're able to notice things that you wouldn't otherwise notice so that's the whole point and it's a habit that just keeps building on itself the more you do it the better you get the more excited you get and it's something that becomes really uh really personal and and really fantastic to share with other people as well so I'm going to tell you a little bit about just drawing in nature and uh, we're going to also go over the class materials for today but this is probably the cheapest, most affordable hobby you can ever get into because all you need is a sketchbook, a pencil and a pen. That's it. That's the baseline kit that you would need to start doing nature drawing. And if you're doing this at home, you can use whatever you want, right? But when you're out in the field, you wanna stay light, you wanna stay mobile. So anything else that you want, you can just kind of modularize on top of that baseline kit. And that's like color pencils, watercolor paints. And if you're more of the scientific type, that would also include things like compact lenses, microscopes, specimen collecting kits, and things like that. So you start small and you build your way up as you build more uh, of a game plan for whatever you're gonna be doing out in nature. And when you want to get started, just keep it personal. Start with things that interest you and keep you excited. For me, I really love birds. I really love plants. And I'm really getting into reading the landscape, kind of like a book, right? I'm interested in learning about natural navigation techniques. And those are things that really come in handy for me as a wilderness guide when I'm leading backpacking trips or day hikes, right? But for you, it could be things like leaves and feathers and other nature objects that you can really get an up close and personal look with. And uh, we'll be getting a little bit into that when we do our warm up exercise in just a moment. But the idea is you want to use that baseline kit that I told you about in the last slide and keep it handy so that whenever you find something interesting, you could either write it down or you can do a quick little sketch and move on because if you keep it in your bag or you keep it away, it's just not going to be used. So um, the whole point of today's class is to give you the tools you need to do this on your own. Okay. So as, as much as I love drawing with you, I'd love to draw with you every day, but we're all from around the world. So this is the best way I can, I can give you the skills that I have so that you can take the practice and run with it. So at this point, we're going to start our nature drawing exercise. Okay. And we're going to be focusing on a nature object. Okay. And since it's World Oceans Week, this whole week is about um, spreading love about the ocean and um, basically celebrating the stewardship that we would like to pursue moving forward. Uh, so I invite you to take out your pencil, take out your paper, and that's all you'll need for this exercise. And I also have a reference photo, voila, that I emailed to everybody. You can also download that in the, um, in the chat. And for those of us who are watching this recording, it's in the link below. So you'll be able to download this as well. And there are some tips on the right-hand side that you can read at your leisure. So very basic shape. These are for the beginners. If you're more advanced, hang on. I got something for you in a minute. And I'm also going to share my top-down camera here because I want to be able to 
uh, give you a view of what I'm doing as well. That would be helpful, right? Uh, so here we are. These are the basic materials that I'm gonna be using for this exercise, just a pencil. And I also have my eraser and my pencil sharpener. So I have a nice pointy tip and we'll be talking about how to use pencils a little bit better in a bit. It may sound pretty straightforward, but you'd be surprised. And I also have some specimens here that I collected from a beach. And uh, these are tropical shells. I also have a exoskeleton or a, um, a leftover of a sea urchin. And I think the closest specimen I have here uh, that matches with the reference photo is this. So why draw a nature object when you have a million photos on the internet? Well, first of all, drawing a three-dimensional object while it's in your hand is something that will give you a, uh, a different type of exercise. It'll make your brain work differently, right? It's not a flat image. It's something that has dimension, texture, and it's also a really cool way to um, make an artifact with a, let's say for example, you didn't want to take the shell home. You do a little drawing of it and that's your, that's your kind of souvenir, right? You keep it nice and neat in your nature journal. So to get started, what I do is I consider the width and the height of the object. And um, for those of us who work digitally as well, you know, it's important to have the right proportions so that everything's to scale. So let's go ahead. I'm going to share my screen with you really quick. And uh, let's take another look at this reference photo here. So what you want to consider is the height and the width of this object, okay? And we're gonna approach this like an architect before we think about it like an artist. We're gonna think about the dimensions and we're gonna think about how we can best come up with a game plan for how to execute this drawing accurately and to scale, okay? So really quick, what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to start by some key points, all right? And since I wanna blow this image up and make it a little bigger than it is in real life, these key points are going to be the constraints that I set uh, or the parameters that I set rather to start building my blueprint, right? Because I'm thinking like an architect. Now, believe it or not, the most simple form of mark making is a dot, right? And for those of us who are brand new, this is how we can start by creating a kind of blueprint or game plan for the rest of our drawing. So if we consider the base of this shell, right? It's a type of scallop shell. I'm just gonna go ahead and plot these coordinates out just like I'm making a blueprint, right? And this blueprint doesn't have to be written in stone, right? It's something that is flexible and it's considered to be more of a measurement system than it is a drawing system because technically we're not even starting this drawing yet, okay? So what I'm doing is I'm creating an outline that I'm going to then build on top of when I do actually start drawing with line, okay? And this, the whole purpose of this outline here is just to get the correct proportions. Okay, that's it. Okay, so having this in place allows me to be a little bit more flexible. So let's say, for example, I wanna change the scale of something, right? Or I wanna move something. All I have to do is move over the, the dots that I've put down on paper and then readjust without even having to worry about erasing. Okay, and this takes away the fear and the apprehension of making a drawing because as for those of us who are more experienced now, uh, you remember what it was like when you first started out. There's a little bit of that bravery that you need to get started. And all I'm doing right now is I'm just looking at some of the dimensions of this seashell here and I'm considering it as a blueprint first. And now that I've done that, what I can do is just start drawing on top of it because the blueprint is in place. Now, as we consider the line that we're gonna be using, I recommend not putting too much pressure down on the paper first. We're gonna talk about line weight variation in a little bit, but what that essentially means is we're going to be nice and light and we're gonna add a little bit of an advanced technique in just a minute, but look how just how slightly I'm going over the blueprint that I did earlier, right? So, let me get my camera just a little bit closer here. Okay. And that should be full screen. If you're seeing a tiny little thumbnail, just click on that thumbnail and that will make my screen full screen. Okay. So all I'm doing right now is I'm not even tracing over these dots. I'm using these dots like guidelines because guess what? If I feel like this isn't the correct path to go, again, these were measurements earlier. I don't have to follow them, right? So I can go ahead and say, hmm, okay, maybe I wanna make this part a little bit wider. All I have to do is start, stop, 
consider what the proportions look like based on the reference. And then I can decide whether or not I wanna keep going. If I do, I keep going. If not, I simply just ignore the dots that are there and I keep drawing anyway, okay? And you're gonna notice that there's sort of a, a serrated edge that goes around the shell, okay? So as we get um, a little bit further along in our drawing here, we'll be able to use this texture or this, uh, this edge or this margin to our advantage. And all we're gonna do is just go ahead and use those dots as guidelines. Okay, again, we have that little blueprint down, just like a contractor builds a building using a blueprint, we're building or drawing using a blueprint as well. Okay, and you might see that I'm going a little bit beyond, and that's me just actively editing. You know, you don't have to be completely married to the blueprint either. That's something that just helps you get started so that everything's in the correct proportion. And then as you go, as you continue, what you're doing is you're keeping an eye on the reference, you're keeping an eye on the blueprint that you originally laid out, and then you're going to be checking yourself to see if your proportions and dimensions are accurate. Okay, and it just really takes away, especially for the newer people, it really takes away that apprehension of starting a drawing, because all you're doing is you're looking, you're building, you're actively editing, and you're measuring. Okay, not even worried about making mistakes. And if there's a part of it, like over here, that feels a little bit skewed, come over with your dots again and try to make a correction, see if that works. And if it doesn't, that's okay. No pressure, you're not being graded on this. So if you just wanna make a little correction, let's say you wanna widen out your shell a little bit on the top, just like this, just go ahead and do it. Don't worry about erasing yet, okay? And then after you're happy, after you see that this, by comparing it to the work that you just did pr prior, to, um, prior to making your uh, adjustment, if that makes you happy, then you can feel free to erase to your heart's desire. But just get the paper filled with material first, then worry about erasing. It, it's really just going to slow you down if all you do is draw, erase, draw, erase, draw, erase, just draw. And then once you're done um, setting up your drawing, you can take your eraser, and right here I'm using, I'm using a kneaded eraser. It's very kind to the paper. And I'm just gonna go in and remove all of those blueprints that I don't need anymore. Any of those key marks that I don't need, I get rid of. And what that does is it declutters the drawing, okay? And it gives you a fresher start for the next phase. And that's where line weight variation comes in, okay? There we go. And if you wanna get in there and just redo a couple little things, be my guest, that's okay. So what do I mean by line weight variation, okay? When you press hard on the paper, it's going to create a darker line and that line is, in a sense feels heavier, okay? And this is a nice little trick when you're considering the light value or the shadow of your nature objects, right? So if the light source is coming from directly above this way, the underside down here is going to be darker naturally, right? So what you can do to kind of emphasize that darkness without having to shade is just find where the shadow is and make a thicker line just like that. If you look, see where the shadow is, you press a little bit harder, okay? And the kind of pencil I'm using is a, is a softer lead. It's a, it's a 2D on the hardness scale. And that's what I recommend because I'm not really even pressing that hard. Um, it's just a, an easier medium to work with. Okay, so just by making the lines darker on the bottom where the shadows are, I am now creating an illusion and that illusion is shadow, okay? Just like that. And when you consider also the different textures that you're going to be encountering too, I have another nice trick for you. Um, this is something that I like to uh, introduce to my advanced students as well. And it's just a different way to use the same pencil you've been using for years and years and years. One other tip I like to suggest is um, if you have a lot of eraser dust, what you can do is use a, a dry paintbrush and just brush the eraser dust off of your drawing because that way you won't smear it. Okay, so if you've been in my classes before, you've heard this. So basically I wanna take your attention and turn it to the tip of this pencil. Notice the difference between these two pencil tips. One's very pointy and the other one is flat, kind of like a chisel tip, right? That's what we want for the next step of this drawing because we're gonna be adding a little bit of texture and this is a technique that we're gonna be borrowing for our next drawing, okay? so. Basically, what you want to do is you want to grab a piece of scrap paper. Okay, I have a little note over here. 
you're just going to take a piece of scrap paper and without pressing too hard, what you're going to do is just make circles, circle, 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 just like this. Okay. And again, I'm not pressing that hard, but if you do this enough with a sharp pencil, what's going to happen is the angle of your hand is going to grind down that tip, okay, so that it's nice and flat like that, okay? And that's where we're going to take um, our next step together with the texture of this shell, okay? So look at the lines and see how these are uh, following the contour of the shell, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take my flat tip, my chisel tip here, and I'm gonna start making a few marks that just simply go along with the shape and the contour uh, of the shell, right? When I talk about the contour, I'm just talking about when, it, when you have a three-dimensional object, what you're going to inevitably encounter are the curves, the different, dimensions okay so as you look at the curve look at the dots on this shell that i collected here see how they fade like there's a little bit of perspective that happens here okay we're going to consider that with the line work we're going to be doing on this seashell okay so as you make your lines okay if this is the beginning of the shell okay they're going to be very close together towards this end. And then as they get towards the middle, they kind of widen out a little bit. Okay, start very close together and let them widen out a little bit. Okay, just like that. And use that flat tip just to get the basic structure down here because what we're going to be doing a little bit is we're going to be adding a, uh, another layer. We're going to be doing a base coat. And this base coat is going to give us more texture and it's going to make these lines that we're making right now feel more believable and realistic. Okay, so another thing I like to do is keep a little piece of scrap paper at hand so that when I rest my hand down on the paper, I'm not going to be smearing the pencil work that I just did. Okay, sometimes it's good to get your hands dirty, but when you're working with graphite or charcoal, sometimes your, your fingers might smudge something that you don't want to be smudged. And that's why it's just a good idea to keep uh, your hand clean by having another piece of scrap paper to rest on top of. Okay. You also want to have a nice loose grip on your pencil. You don't want to just be strangling it. You know, this is like an endurance exercise. So the, the more relaxed your grip, the longer and more comfortable, um, the longer you'll be able to draw and the more comfortable your drawing experience will be. Okay, just like that. So notice how they're far, they're spaced far apart towards the tip of the shell, but back here, they're closer together. That's what I was talking about um, when I had mentioned the uh, proportions the, 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 the um, sorry, the contours of the shell, okay? Nice and close at the base, very far apart at the tip, okay? And you don't even have to connect the lines all the way. You can just kind of have them be line segments as well. That does the job, okay? If you have to correct a line, don't worry about it. Just draw it. Then you look, you analyze it. If you don't need it, get rid of it. But just always don't don't let your first instinct to be a race if you feel like your drawing isn't perfect because it's okay you you want to get more on the paper than um you want to get more lead on the paper than you want to race or dust let's just say that so now that we've gotten the basic contour down okay we're going to be wrapping up this uh warm-up exercise in just a minute but i want to show you a little bit about using this chisel tip kind of like a paintbrush Okay, and what I mean is we're going to be applying a little layer, another layer of graphite or material to our nature object in the areas where, where they have shadow. So I'm going to start with the base here, and I'm just going to use a very light, and I'm barely resting the material, the pencil on the paper, a very, very light layer of graphite here, and I'm just using circles, tiny, tiny circles, just like what we used when we created our chisel tip in the first place. Okay, I'm just using nice light circles and that's creating a nice even distribution of material. Okay, I'm not having areas that are inconsistent. The entire part is going to have the same consistency, the entire part meaning the, uh, the area with the shadow. Okay, and we can come back in here later with our sharper pencil and really kind of bring out some of those lines that we drew earlier because they're starting to be hidden by the shadow now, that's okay. 
So what I'm gonna do is just use my piece of scrap paper to cover up the work I've done so far, protect it. And I'm gonna move over here with my pencil and I'm just gonna pick out the spots that have the shadow and I'm using my chisel tip, remember that. And the, the best kind of graphite hardness for this in my experience is a 2B hardness on the hardness scale. And if you buy a pack of drawing pencils, that scale should be on the back. Okay, and in areas where you're gonna be running into a tight spot, you just wanna use single direction strokes. Okay, sorry, my hand was covering that up. What I mean by single direction strokes is this. If, if I have a little area where the circle technique isn't gonna work, I'm just gonna go ahead and use a single direction stroke, making sure the flat edge is flush with the paper. And that way I'm going to be able to get the effect I want, the nice even distribution of material without creating grooves in the paper. Okay, just like that. Single direction, just like a paintbrush. Okay, so in these little areas where we're having these, uh, these grooves, those are gonna be a nice little touch, especially when we come back with our pointed pencil, right? And we go over some of these lines that we made earlier. That's really gonna help bring this out. Okay, so this is just the warm up. This is the basic hike and draw drawing technique. It's something that we go over uh, in our in nature drawing intro class. And it's something that we use as a foundation for our more advanced classes, such as botanical drawing, and um, also uh, some of our color pencil drawing classes as well. So this is the basic technique for shading. And also look at the tip. There's a little bit of a, a nice reddish hue towards the tip. And even though this isn't a color pencil, the same technique works for color pencils as well, especially when you want to add layer upon layer of color. And again, that comes in handy, especially when you wanna do things like botanical drawing or bird feathers or fur things like that. Those are all things that we go over in our other workshops as well. Okay, so here I am just finishing up my shading here. We don't wanna to spend too much time in the warm ups. that I just wanna make sure that we have enough time to finish the uh, long form drawing exercise. Okay, and it was really interesting. Um, I was reading an article on National Geographic last month about uh, different types of endangered species that don't get enough attention. And believe it or not, there are endangered species of shellfish in the United States that nobody's even heard about because they don't have uh, the same kind of cute, cuddly attributes as, I don't know, like a tiger or a panda bear. So I thought it was uh, a really interesting read. And since this is World Oceans Week, it was just something I figured I'd, I'd mention in this class. Um, I know that there are some volunteer groups that participate in shoreline cleanups and things like that. So. If you're not landlocked and you live by an ocean, I think it would be a great use of an afternoon to just take a friend on a walk and pick up whatever junk you see and just leave the place better than you found it. That's that whole idea of environmental stewardship. I think actions speak louder than words. And nowadays people seem to just have a lot of talk and no action. So that's a really cool homework assignment if you feel inclined. Okay, so I'm just using my pointed tip here. I switched my pencils again, and I am going and just bringing out some of the um, the highlights, or, or sorry, the uh, the finer lines that we drew earlier. Okay, there we go, just like that. Cool. Now I want to talk to you really, really quick about just um, the other things you can do while drawing nature objects. And I love taking notes. So let's say, for example, that we were all on a, a beach walk together, right? And let's say that we were in, uh, let's go on vacation together, shall we? Let's say we were in uh, Hawaii, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just write down the date. So today is the 12th of June, okay? And uh, I'm gonna also write down the location, right? So let's say that we are, um, let's see, give me an exotic beach location. That's a good one. Let's say we are in Maui, right? And we're on Airport Beach in Maui. Okay, so what we've just done is we've created a timestamp and a location, okay? Now the next job would be to identify this type of shell, right? 
it's a basic scallop shell, right? We don't know what kind. Obviously, the marine biologist in the audience would would know that just saying a scallop is like just calling a flying thing a bird. It's there's a lot of different types of scallops. So what I'm going to do is just write what I know, and um, that's okay if you don't know too much because what we can do next is we can go ahead and ask questions, right? So we we know it's a scallop, but what kind, right? So not only are we leaving with a actual specimen that we drew, we're actually including real scientific data, which is the date and the location. And we're also kind of trying to figure out, okay, what are some other attributes of this shell that can really help us? So to scale, okay, I have a little grid here. These are about two centimeters each, okay? So if I lay this shell down, it's not the same one, but let's just pretend it is. We're looking at, um, four by four and a quarter centimeters in dimension, right? So adding measurements, that's another thing that's considered scientific data, okay? So what I'll do is I'll just make a little reference here to the size, okay? This is approximately four centimeters. And then uh, the width will be about 4.15 centimeters. Okay, so just building on top of a drawing and again, putting together that idea that you're, you're an explorer, you're, you're actually participating in something that would be considered a scientific entry, like you're, you're creating a, a report. And if you collect enough of these um, over the course of five years, 10 years, 15 years, you'll actually have quite a database build up just based on your direct observations. So that's our warm up exercise. Let's go ahead and jump into the next one. Okay, now for this exercise here, we're going to be using the same types of, um, of mediums and techniques, but I'd also like to invite you, if you're interested, to take out your color pencils too, if you want to play, play with color, because the pencil technique we're going to be using is um, the same that you would be using with color pencil as well. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about creating um, some consistency with the environment as well. So. Let's go ahead and look at this reference photo together. And uh, of course, everybody knows this little favorite fish. Everybody loves the clownfish or the anemone fish, depending on where you're from. And uh, this, is a, 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 this is a type of fish that has a symbiosis with its environment, right? So the sea anemone has stinging cells, okay? It's kind of like a similar arrangement that a jellyfish would have. But because there is a symbiotic relationship, this um, clownfish is kind of like a janitor, right? And helps clean and, 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 and uh, keep the sea anemone free of things like parasites and things that the sea anemone doesn't want growing on it. They don't get stung. It's a really, really, really interesting thing. So the sea anemone gets, um, gets cleaned, the clownfish gets protection, right? And um, we're gonna go ahead and start with this. So I invite you to just take out another piece of paper and go ahead and I'm going to uh, share my top down camera with you again here. All right, cool. So I'm just going to go ahead and save a little bit of paper here by just flipping mine over. Okay. And I'm just working on a five and a half by seven and a half inch piece of cardstock, nothing fancy at all. Okay. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to square off my page and I invite you to do the same. And basically all that means is just make a little frame. Okay. So in our last drawing, I drew right next to my notes, right? They were right on top of each other. Since this is more of a drawing exercise and less of a field study, I like to keep my notes outside of the drawing and I keep them in the margins here. So you can put the date, subject, anything else you want in these margins. And also, if you're really proud of your drawing, you want to put it in a picture frame, this will help give it a little bit of a, uh, of a margin to uh, protect it from being overshadowed by the frame. Okay, so it doesn't have to be perfect, this will do. Um, so let's go ahead and start off again, if you want to give it a shot with your color pencils, this is going to be a really interesting coloring project just because you have a lot of interesting uh, colors going on in there. So uh, for the sake of, of time, I'm just going to stick with pencil. 
And we're going to go ahead and attack this the same way that we did before by looking at it like an architect first. Okay, so let's build this together. I'm going to go ahead and say that I want the, um, the clownfish. I want the tip of it to be here. And approximately, again, this could be a variable here based on the size that you want to draw your fish. I'm going to have the length be about this wide. Okay, so I'm going to put a key point here and a key point here representing the length. And then I'm going to represent the width with the width by placing two other key points. Okay. And this is just my foundation to build on top of. Okay. So this little diamond shape that I see here represents the height and the width of the specimen. Okay. And that's the clownfish again. So we can go ahead and get started by building up our plan or, or constructing our blueprint together. How's that sound? So all I'm going to be doing is following the contours or the outlines of this clownfish. And you can see there's a little fin that kind of trails off. I, I'm just noticing that. So I'm actually gonna forget about this little key point that I put there and go past it because there's a fin that goes below and it's covered up by a piece of the sea anemone. Okay, now that's a really interesting environment to draw too because these are all tubular, um, tubular structures that kind of blur out behind the main image. So they're gonna be in focus in the front, which means we'll have to draw a lot of them. But once we get to the background, we can kind of fudge it a little bit because it gets a little bit blurry. And that way you can create a nice little bit of, um, of, an, of like an artificial focus effect with your drawing. So I have this little piece here, this is where the fin goes. And then there's that little piece of sea anemone that comes over the fin right? So that's obstructing the fin just slightly. Okay, kind of looks like a snake or an eel. And what I'm going to do next is find that other fin and walk up the side just like this. Okay, and you have a, a nice variety of color here too. You have some wonderful blues and you have some, those are all reflective colors. And you have some wonderful oranges too. But we're not worried about that right now. Let's just get the blueprints completed so that we can start our drawing. So this is the other fin on the underside here. Doesn't have to be perfect. And uh, tell you what, if you want to do something fun, one thing I like to do is let's just say I want to extend the tail out. I can make the tail cross over this little margin that I made earlier, just like this. And it kind of has like a fun little 3D effect, like it's swimming in from the side and it's on top of the frame rather than in the frame. So that would be fun. So I'm just gonna do that for the heck of it. Okay, and we could also use the object itself or the specimen itself to create a frame of reference for the rest of the dimensions and proportions. So here he is swimming in from the side. Okay, we have the underside, these are the fins. We have some anemone that we're gonna to have to draw down there. And as you come up from the underside here, right? Just gonna go ahead and check my work. And I think I'm gonna, gonna just move my, my uh, blueprint down a little bit. I think this feels better, more in line with the fin. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and start constructing the face. And I think that's a really good term to use, constructing, because all we're doing, we're not worried about mistakes or anything like that, is we're measuring and we're going to, um, we're going to build on top of those measurements. Okay, so that's where that little eye socket comes out on the other side, sort of protrudes, okay, as most fish's eyes do. Okay. All right, and it may feel like it's a little flat, but this is a rounded, remember we were talking about contour earlier? If I, if I bring in this cowrie shell here, this is a rounded top. Right. So if I just drew the outline of it, it would feel very flat. But when I come in with my chisel tip pencil later, what we're going to be doing is adding the roundness to the top of the fish. So even though it may feel a little bit wide and flat right now, that's only a temporary thing. Okay, so we're going to go ahead. I'm just going to note the distance between this little eye socket here to where the dorsal fin comes up. Just like that. And I'm not so worried about making sure it's the perfect kind of um, texture or anything like that. Right now, I'm just focused on proportions. That's it. 
Okay, and then we'll build on top of these proportions in just a little bit. But again, I, I teach this way because dots are super easy to make. Anybody can make a dot. And uh, for those of us who are a little bit more advanced, you remember what it was like starting out. So I appreciate your patience there. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and consider based on the positioning and the size of this eye here, the space, okay, in between here and the second eye. So I'm not going to draw the eye. I'm just going to plan where I intend to draw the eye, okay? So this is a big circle, but the eye is actually gonna be inside of this circle because it's a protruding eye. It's not embedded in the fish's head. It's kind of on the outside of the fish's head, okay? So you're gonna have like kind of a bullseye sort of effect as you get closer and closer to the dark spot in the middle, that iris there, all right? And for the mouth, I'm gonna note the distance between the eye stalk and the mouth. And that's gonna give me a, a, be, a more accurate placement of it. And even though this is a, um, a very serious looking fish, we're gonna make them, <laughs> he's serious because the mouth is kind of downturned a little bit. So we're gonna make the mouth um, as accurate as we can. It's gonna have that sort of downturn to it. But I like to think he's a happy guy. I don't think that there's such thing as a, sad clownfish. Okay, so here we go. This is the, uh, the basic blueprint. And if you want, you can also consider the ribbons or the bands that surround this fish, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of illustrate some of the roundness that we're going to draw in just a little bit by considering the bands of the, uh, of the pattern, the white and the black. So there we go. And I'm also going to come around here from the tail, uh, from the dorsal fin rather. And I'm going to note that I may wanna just consider resizing my dorsal fin by making it a little bit bigger, right? So if I look at where the eye is, okay? I look at where this ribbon is, and now I jump a little bit to here about, right? Now I'm trying, there we go. Now I'm getting the correct proportions for where the ribbon is. Now, if you look at the reference photo, the fin actually is up here and I have my fin down here. So all I have to do, I don't have to worry about erasing. I just make my fin bigger. I add to the drawing. I don't take away from it. I'm building it up. I'm not tearing it down, okay? That's where that whole idea of constructing a drawing comes from. All right, and then I just go ahead and make sure that this Fin is to scale, no pun intended. And um, from there, I'm just gonna make sure I extend it the right distance. And now we're cooking with gas, cool. So now uh, this final ribbon that comes around uh, the center here, oh, sorry, it's not the final one, the final one's in the, in the back, uh, just helps to reinforce the roundness that we're gonna draw a little bit later. And this final ribbon in the back here, okay, I'm just going to take note of that. So there's the blueprint that we're gonna draw on top of, right? And you can go in and fiddle around a little bit more with it if you really wanna just emphasize where the scales end, where they begin, how they're attached to the body, that's all well and good. Um, and for the dorsal fin, yeah, we can just do that. Okay, now we're ready to draw. Okay, so gonna go ahead and just resharpen my pencil here, just to put a nice fine tip on it. I want it to be sharp. And what you can do also, if you have a kneaded eraser as well, is you can take your kneaded eraser and get rid of all the, all the measurements, uh, all the key marks that are either not needed or are just in the way. And another thing I like to do after I'm done cleaning up the things that I don't need anymore. Okay, like that line, it's coming in from the side, so I don't need this border line cutting through the tail. Um, you can go ahead and feel free to just take your kneaded eraser and press it down on the paper and then peel off some of the material to make your blueprint just a little bit lighter, okay? And what that's going to do is as you draw on top of it, 
going to make the dots feel almost invisible. You're not even going to notice them anymore because your line is going to be so much darker than these dots that they're not even going to be a distraction. Okay, so all I'm doing is pushing down this kneaded eraser on the paper, just like that. You can hear how sticky it is, right? Okay, and it's kind of like a ghost image now. Now I'm really dealing with a nice blueprint, okay? Great, so at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider, I'm gonna consider how I'm gonna start adding a line to this blueprint, all right? Let's go ahead and get started. So whenever I draw an animal, any type of wildlife, I like to start with the eye. And that's because it is a, if you nail the eye, you're going to have a, a, a bit of life, a spark of life in your drawing. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start with the darkest part first, and I'm not going to fill it in. I'm just going to create the outline of the eye. Let me zoom in my camera just a little bit, just so I can give you a better angle there. Okay, there we are. Closer look. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the outer edge of, the, uh, or sorry, the inner edge of the eye here. Very, very lightly. I'm barely pressing down on the paper. And that's another benefit of using a softer lead. Um, it gives you the ability to get a, a, a finer and darker line without having to press hard at all. Because the, the harder the pencil material, the graphite, um, the, the harder you have to press in order for it to actually give you a dark line. So usually technical drawers will use a, um, a hard pencil to start and then draw on top of that in order to reduce any kind of smudging or any type of um, line weight conflicts that they don't want to have. So I'm just paying close attention to this eye. Okay, you don't even have to connect it all the way. Just draw a little bit at a time and take a pause, look at it, see that we have this inner circle here surrounded by that outer circle there. And then this is like kind of an eye stalk almost like you would see on an insect. It's, it's pushing the eye away from the body. Okay, and you don't even have to finish the lines there. You can go in there and get rid of some of those marks you don't need, brush away with the paintbrush there. And then you can get in here and start playing with dots again, but more so as a way to add texture, right? We'll, we'll build on that later. But the trick here is just to get a nice realistic looking eye, okay? And then we'll take our chisel tip pencil or your chisel tips colored pencil later and then you can go in there and fill it in. Let's move on to the next one. We have the other eye over here on the opposite side. Okay. And I'm gonna go ahead and just work my way around very lightly, not pressing down hard at all. Okay. And then I'm gonna go ahead and draw where it connects to the body. Okay. There you go. And you're going to notice that as you, as you get closer, you're going to find that you're, you're going, you, you want to draw what you see, not what you think you see, right? So looking at this eye stock a little bit more closely, there are areas like, for example, here, very, very fine detail there that gives me an indication that, okay, as I go ahead and fill in this area with some texture, okay, that's going to be a different texture than the top of this eye. That's going to be a different texture than where it meets the body. Okay. So nothing, there's nobody said that everything needs to be symmetrical. All right. So if your drawing has a little bit of asymmetry in it, that's not a bad thing. That's okay. Okay. So I'm going to go down here to the mouth now and I'm going to draw the mouth, not like this, where it comes down as a line. I'm actually going to draw where the, where the mouth meets the body too, okay? So here's the body, and I'm gonna bring the mouth around from the other side of this line as if it's wrapped around, which it is. Okay, I'm gonna bring it around just like that. And what that looks like up close, I'm gonna hold this up to the camera, okay? Is I'm coming around from the back side of this line, so it should be a, a, not a continuation of this line, but a separate line. And then what that's going to do is it's going to allow me to create that sort of roundness that I'm looking for, okay? And it would make it feel more realistic. Okay, and the mouth is kind of downturned, just like that. It's a serious clownfish. 
Okay, and I'm gonna use the dots again, just to kind of help me stay honest here. And then that'll give me a more accurate downturn mouth. Okay, same thing here. I don't want the lip on the bottom to just be a part of this same line. I'm gonna start a different line. Again, I'm gonna make it seem like it's coming from the underside like that. Okay, give it a bump just like that, bump, and then bring it down just like this. And let some of that bump overlap like that, okay? So I'm gonna hold this up to the camera again so you can see a little bit more closely, okay? So right here, let that bump kind of come around and end and then start another line. So it's not just one continuous line segment that represents the body and the mouth, it's the body the top lip, the bottom lip, and the underside of the mouth. Okay, so that's gonna help make it feel more realistic there. Okay, and if you're interested in doing things like character design, we have classes like that with our other um, illustrator, our other instructor, Connor Nolan. He's a sci-fi and fantasy illustrator. And he teaches you how to use nature as a way to construct narratives, to build characters, and also to build environments. So that's a really fun class too, if you're inclined to try one of them. Okay, so as I'm going down the body, I'm gonna be doing the same exact thing I did with the mouth here. See how it comes down and around. And then there's this part, let's call it the chin, that I'm gonna curl up. And then the other side of the body is going to just proceed. It's going to proceed down like this until we run into our first, uh, let's call it a tendril of our scene enemy, okay? So what this does is it creates an illusion, like it puts this in front of this when you create that layer of separation. That's a really good trick to use. Okay, so there's the underside of the fish so far. We have our anemone stalk. Boy, I hate to be stung by that. Okay, and I'm just gonna use Same trick as before. And you could build these stalks up as you go. They're tubular, they're rounded at the tips. Some of them are asymmetrical, some of them are very symmetrical. It's a mixed bag, so. Don't worry about having it be too uniform. Okay, so I'm just drawing enough of them to get started here. So we have that other fin that goes on the underside. I'm just gonna bring that down there. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and continue where we left off on the body here. Okay, there's the fin. And we'll add some line weight variation in just a bit. You know, we wanna get all of our line work done first before we go ahead and start jumping in with the lighter lines, darker lines. In general, I think it's just best practice to start with a very light pressure and only add more pressure after you're 110% sure it's necessary. It's always easier to go darker when using pencil than it is to go lighter again, okay? And I want you to draw more than erase. Not that erasing is wrong, erasing is all fine. It's just that especially if you're new, it's good to get in the habit of getting marks down on the paper. And you know, cause that's actually drawing. You know, you want to spend your time drawing, not erasing. Only erase when you know it's necessary. Okay, so all I'm doing is I'm just following the contours of the fins here very loosely, just enough to make it a convincing thing. And we have some shadow that we're going to consider in a little bit. Uh, I also like to use line segments. Like remember in our seashell, let me just flip this page over really quick. If you look closely, these are line segments. They're not, not all of these are finished lines here. Okay, so what I do is I'll do a part that's dark and I'll break it and I'll continue it and I'll break it again. And it just adds, I don't know, a little something to it that feels pleasing. Like right here is a little segment. Started dark, broke segment, then just let it run out. And something about that feels pleasing. So I'm gonna consider that for my fish as well uh, in areas like the fin. 
Okay, and we'll fill that in with more details in a moment. So let's continue on our underwater journey together here with the other fin on the bottom. Okay, we have a little moment there where the sea anemone comes up. Now I'd recommend for this environment to create a base coat for all of the sea anemones. Once you draw them all out in line, give them all a base coat, a very, very light base coat. And that could either be with paint or with color pencil or regular pencil. And the reason why you do that is because you want to create a baseline standard, right? Or a baseline value for your environment. And then you can start to push and pull the lights and the darks in that environment according to your needs, right? So that you're not just focusing at one stalk at a time of the sea anemone. You're looking at them as, a, as part of a complete whole. And that's really important. Same thing, I teach the exact same thing when we're drawing trees, same thing when I'm drawing mountains. And those are things that we always talk about in our landscape drawing classes. Right. So I don't want the tail to run off the edge of the page. So I'm going to kind of adjust it a little bit so that it fits. And that's part of that creative license that you have as an artist. You can kind of warp reality just a little bit. Not too much, because you still want it to be accurate, but just a little bit to fit your needs. Or to fit the needs of your drawing, let's say, if you want to put it that way. Okay, here's that band that we have here. It goes around the tip of the tail. Okay, and it's also layered. So you have this little darker area. Whoops, that was an unintentional mark. You have this little darker area here that you're just gonna push in a little bit. You're not even gonna worry about coloring it right now. Okay, and if you're working with color pencil, typically you know, you're know you working with one shade at a time rather than picking one up, putting one down, picking one up, putting one down. It's very methodical. And in our color pencil class, we go over the, the right step-by-step -step procedure for creating a color pencil illustration. Okay, so that's gonna be the tail. Right, and there's like a little outline that I'm noticing too. There you go, get some texture on that. Nice. So we're gonna continue building, constructing our drawing here, focusing on the back end of this fish. So um, as this dorsal fin emerges from the body, let's also keep an eye on how it also connects with the band that goes around that, um, back part of the fish of the tail. Okay. Go ahead and add a little bit of that nice wavy line there. Nice and light. Keep it light. And just kind of reinforce that a little bit because it's this part's rounded as it meets the body. Okay, and this other part meets the tail. All right. So I want to just emphasize a little bit that kind of translucent, purpley, bluey kind of color, bluish kind of color. <clears throat> okay. So this area, this nice little black ribbon here is gonna meet the body. Then it's going to emerge from the dorsal onto the body. And we're gonna trace it right down to the very bottom here, okay? Same thing on this side, comes out, in, out, just like that to help emphasize the roundness. And it's gonna end in a flatter, boom, right there, a little flatter end right there. Okay, we have this tail that comes, this little underside that comes out right from here. Okay, so I'm just gonna pay a little bit of, closer attention to this because it's gonna round out a little bit like that actually. There we go. Okay, and we'll worry about cleaning up the rest of that later. Okay. So let's see where the top of this fin 
meets the body. Okay, and just looking at this fish, my mind's filled with all different kinds of questions. And that's kind of the whole point, is you want to collect questions, just like you're a field researcher or something. You know, if I'm looking at a fish like this, I'm wondering how many different types of species live like the clownfish, or how many different types of clownfish species are there? Um, why are they orange with this type of pattern? You know, if they're supposed to be living symbiotically with the sea anemone, why are they not the same color as the sea anemone? That's like the kind of way my, my thought process goes as I'm drawing. And that's something that takes a little bit of practice. I think it's important to train your brain either by ingesting material, like, you know, reading books, things like that, watching documentaries, reading scientific magazines, things like that. But it's also good to train your brain by creating as well. And creating questions and creating questions is equally as important as creating drawings in my mind. And yes, it is true. A lot of animals are colorblind. I saw, um, for instance, yeah, uh, the, the example of the tiger being orange uh, has to do with the type of um, animal that they hunt, right? There's a certain species of deer that cannot see orange and it makes it pretty much, um, pretty much the best kind of camouflage that a tiger can have uh, when hunting those deer. And if you've ever seen what a, a hunter, like a human hunter looks like, what do they wear? You know, if they're not wearing that uh, mossy oak breakup camo, they're wearing that orange color. And that's a, another reason. So yeah, I guess uh, I know that some fish have different, they see different wavelengths, like some of them can see infrared. So that could have something to do with it too. But those are all great questions and great things to consider as you, um, as you develop your practice. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So Let's go ahead and continue. We have this nice ridge here. And as the top of the dorsal fin sort of waves like a flag. Okay, and the body It's going to go right through it like that. Nice and light. Just like that. Okay, and again, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to see where this sort of black ribbon follows the top, comes around like that, follows the top, follows the top very, very lightly and loosely. And then comes down just like this. and continues on to the body like so. So an interesting little factoid I picked up while watching a documentary is about evolution. It talks about how the eye evolved. Not the human eye, but the eye in general. And it was really interesting how one of these documentaries spoke about how it had to do with recognizing um, the sun, okay? And, 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 and as a microorganism, the, when the sun came out, sometimes like since you're, lit, since you're so tiny, you're in a micro environment, that sunlight can create inhospitable conditions and you, you know, basically you die if you, if you heat it up too much. Um, so the eye is recognized as a sort of indicator of the sun so that since everything was microscopic and living in a liquid base, it would swim down further away from the sun to a cooler microclimate, and that way it would survive better. And based on that little um, evolution, because after all, an evolution is basically a mutation that works, uh, over time, that became what, the, uh, what we know as the eye. Okay, and human eyes are very interesting because um, basically any animal that originated from the water has, has like a, a, a watery solution inside the eye, okay? And it's kind of interesting because when you go underwater, 
you notice how light bends in certain ways, right? And it's kind of crazy, but the fish's eyes don't do that, right? So underwater, they see very clearly, depending on the species. And when we go underwater, we don't. And that's because of the layer of liquid that's within our eyeball. Now, one of the, one of the researchers speculated in this documentary I was watching that as the mammals came out of the, out of the ocean, um, we weren't able to handle not having that kind of uh, liquid in front of our eye. So our eye evolved to actually contain liquid so that we can see things clearly and that they wouldn't be blurry. So kind of like a backwards sort of, uh, kind of a backwards way to think about it, but it was a really cool documentary and uh, taught me a little bit more about eyes than I ever thought I would know. <laughs> All right, so for the band that's coming on the underside, we're gonna go ahead and just kind of pull it up like this. Okay. And I wish I remembered the name of that documentary. I really do, otherwise I tell you. Uh, but um, it, was a, it was a really long one. It, it, was on, it was on TV. It wasn't on like a streaming service. So it was like just one of those things that came on, I kept on, and then, you know, after it ended, it ended. Okay, so I'm just, I also want to point out that the band passes behind this eye stalk. So you want it to look like this. You don't want it to, to go around the eye stalk. You want it to go through the eye stalk like that, because that'll help create more of that three-dimensional effect there. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and just continue. There's a thinner black ribbon right around here. Okay, and it sort of speckles as it comes out away from the white ribbon here. So you wanna leave that kind of feeling a little bit inconsistent on purpose. You don't want it to feel too cleaned up or too smooth, like you actually want it to, you know, throw some dots in there, use some texture like this, and just kind of create that illusion of it breaking up a little bit, okay? Okay, so for the underside, similar thing. Okay, don't make it perfectly parallel with the white. This nice ribbon is gonna go ahead and just dance around, do its own little thing, and it's gonna help create a little bit of that contrast that you want. Okay, so here we come back to the, to the beginning where that kind of downturned mouth is. Let's bring it out a little bit more like that. It feels a little bit more realistic. Okay, and in that area where I don't need that anymore, I'll just go in there with my eraser and brush it away with my paintbrush, just like that. Okay, and you can use dots to also indicate little areas where a line will be too bold. Okay, like under here, I could come in and just a couple of lines like that, add some roundness, top of the mouth, above the lip, just kind of follow along, add some roundness, and repeat. Okay, under the eye stalk, for example, it's a good place for it, just like that. Okay, come around the underside right here. Just continue a line even and let it just break up like that and dissolve. Okay, then you can come in with your kneaded eraser again, get rid of the ones you don't need. Okay. Just like that. Just like that. And just like that. Cool. So here is the the basic line drawing. Now let's get in there and start with some line weight variation. We have about 14, 14, no, we have about 14 minutes left. Okay. So we're going to use that time to add some line weight variation. So I'm just going to put another tip, another sharp tip on my pointy pencil. And I'm going to have my chisel tip pencil on standby for what we're about to do next. Okay. So line weight variation. Let's identify some places with shadows. Okay, so 
obviously the underside of the fish. You can make darker. And you wanna curl up just like that, these little moments that will help add more dimensional value to your, to your fish, like this underside of the mouth here. Okay, so you come in there just like that and then you stop. It takes a lot of self-control to do this. Then it comes out and it's in the light and then you just bring it down a little bit and stop. Extend it just a little bit and stop. Just like that. And this has a very nice effect. See the difference between the line weight? A lot of self-control there. And just practice it. If you don't get it today, not a big deal. Practice this on your own. And go ahead and add a little bit and then stop. Under the eye stalk and stop. Okay. Follow that fin right up there and stop. All righty. So before we get in here with too much texture, let's just go ahead and finish up our line weight variation. Okay. Little moments like this under the back tail. Okay. And we work our way around like that. Okay. Moments up here. Maybe we can hold off on that for now. I'm just going to add a little bit of line weight there. Just there. And I'm going to stop. And uh, where else? Let's see. Eh, I don't want to play with it up here too much. I think that's a good, this is good for now. So let's go ahead and also consider uh, the under parts of these tails. Like I'm just going to go ahead and make little line segments, little dashes, because that's going to help to accentuate the little ruffles that we're seeing in those fins. Same thing here, actually. We can do that here. Um, so you can come in, make little dashes like this. Little dashes, just like that. Okay. And as we come in, these little areas where we want to add a little bit more dimension, use dashes. You don't have to use full lines. Adds a nice bit of variation. And also considering um, going, going to switch it over to the chisel tip now, also considering the same concept as our seashell earlier, right? We helped to create this kind of dimension by making sure that the ridges were closer together towards the base and further apart as it fans out. Do the same thing with the fins, okay? It only where applicable though. So this would be one of those moments. So like if we have a, a place where all of these little ridges in the, in the fins start, keep them closer together where they start and then let them spread further apart as it gets towards the edge, just like that. And you're using your chisel tip pencil at this point, making sure that your pencil tip is flush with the page, okay? And you're also going to note the direction in which these little ridges go, okay? Because it's gonna start pointing upward, and as it fans downward, we're gonna start seeing Directional changes like this, just like that, just like that, all the way around. If you made a little mistake, not a big deal. When we get to the shading portion, you won't even notice it. Okay, and as we get towards the bottom, they're actually gonna be pointing away and down like that. Okay. So when we get towards the top two, you also wanna make sure that you keep that nice and rounded as well. And if you see something that's really bothering you, feel free to edit that. Brush away the dust with a little paintbrush, prevents it from smearing. Okay, same thing for the bottom. And for the bottom part, you can just go in there 
using your chisel tip pencil, nice even strokes like that. Light, barely pressing the paper. Be consistent and your tools will work for you, not against you. Okay, same thing on the undersides over here when you get towards the back of the tail. You can also use single strokes like that, single direction strokes. In the little areas where you have a black ribbon that could really be helpful rather than using the circle technique there. And then when you get outside of that ribbon, you can go ahead and use the circle technique and create a nice little, nice little gradient, just like that. Very, very, very light, very, very light. Okay, and you can always use those single directional strokes to add a little bit more detail. Following the same rules, of course, like we did with the ridges in the scallop shell. Okay, just like that. Okay, and just keep doing the same thing. Apply it all the way around. You wanna jump in over here to the eye. What I recommend is doing that whole inner eye just like this using the chisel tip eraser. So what you're doing is you're creating a, a value that is consistent with the surrounding value, right? So the shadow's outside the eye, same value as that shadow inside the eye. Okay, same value as the shadow underneath the mouth. Okay, we're creating uniformity right now. And that's really important when you wanna have a consistent value. Okay, so nice even circles. Don't press down hard, just let the pencil work for you. Nice even application of material underneath the mouth on the chin right here. Okay, looking and seeing where on the mouth that could really benefit the structure, that roundness that we're looking for. There we go. Maybe there's some more on the eye stalk. Okay, same basic value. Top of the head a little bit. That'll help create some contrast between the top of the head and those eye stalks and even the lips. And you're gonna to start to see a little bit of personality come out. We've been constructing this drawing step-by-step step with just four dots in the beginning to measure the proportions. And then we created our blueprint. We drew on top of our blueprint. Then we drew on top of our line work with a line weight variation. Now we're adding texture and shadow. Okay. And notice we're just, we're all sticking within the same parameters here. We're not, we're thinking about it like a base coat and then you're bringing it darker gradually. You're not just going zero to 60, you're going slowly but surely. Okay, even the little areas where it's white, you wanna get a little bit of that base coat down, especially on the underside. That's really gonna help it feel realistic and it's gonna make it feel rounded and you won't be dealing with a flat fishy. Nice, even application of material. And another benefit of using the 2B pencil is that it will give you a more consistent gradient. It will give you a more consistent value. And it's also going to come off real easy. You're not going to have to sit there making circles that look like curly cues. It's actually going to blend itself as you make these circles like that. Okay, so nice even base coat, look at that. Okay, you wanna give maybe a little bit of shadow on the top just to show that there's a rounded part in the peak, maybe. Just like that. And now that you have that nice base coat, what you can do is just build in there. Okay, make the eye a little bit darker where it needs to get darker. You're gonna notice that the inner part of this eye, you're not gonna have a consistent value in there. You're actually gonna have moments where it stays darker and parts where it stays lighter. So you just be mindful of that as you get in there. 
Same thing with the underside over here. It's going to be slightly darker. And when you want it to get darker, don't press harder. Just make circles in the same spot for longer. And that's just going to distribute more material into the tooth of the page. Okay, nice and easy, just like that. Okay, just want it to be darker. You don't have to press harder. Just a nice, even, same pressure, same style. Just let those layers build up on their own. All you do is just spend more time there and it'll get darker, trust me. Don't have to push down hard at all. Use those single direction strokes. If the circles are getting too repetitious for you. Some people find it meditative, other people find it annoying. It's, it's all about your personal preference. If you wanna use the single strokes, you can go ahead, just make sure you're following the contour of the body, right? Just like that. Okay, for the underside like this, you wanna show it's round. So if you're using the single stroke method like this, single direction strokes, you don't even have to press hard with those either. Same amount of pressure, right? Just follow the contour of the body. Okay, and that's especially helpful with uh, drawing wildlife in particular. If you follow the contours of the body, you're actually gonna make it feel more realistic. Okay, so there we go. Keep working. And just in case you're trying to finish your drawing and it feels like you're not gonna finish it within the limit of the class, we only have about seven minutes left, don't rush it. You can always just sit back and try it at your leisure. You know, you got, the, you got the, the whole methodology in your head now, right? Now that you've sat here and drawn with me today, you've gotten, you've gotten the, the technique, right? So now your job is to practice that technique and. I want you to be able to eventually tackle any drawing project that you want, whether it's at home or in the field with confidence. And I want you to feel like you have at least a system that you can work with to improve at your leisure, right? We think like architects first and artists second. And then we think like scientists the whole time. And that way you're able to use drawing as kind of a, a learning tool Oh, another cool trick with the kneaded eraser is that if, um, here, let me just make this a little bit more consistent in there first. So you can create some nice gradients with the kneaded eraser just by finding a little area and just pushing it down and it kind of just pulls that material back up and it smooths out some of the rougher edges and it creates little highlights for you. So that's a nice little tip. Okay. And the same thing is going to go for the background. Like if you're, if you're interested in doing the whole thing, you know, adding all of the sea anemones and things like that, all of those little tendrils are going to follow the exact same rules. Throw down your base coat after you get the line drawing done, after you finish the line weight variation. Doesn't matter if it's in regular pencil or color pencil, the same methodology applies. And just go after it. with patience in this technique and you'll be able to have a really, really nice drawing. Okay, and after class, I'll be emailing you the video recording, the lesson packet, as well as my finished drawing. This is a fun one. I'd like to spend a little bit more time after, after the class ends and just get this to a place that feels good. Okay. So I could already, I could already tell how the drawing is gonna come out just by the way the face looks. So I'm happy with it so far. Uh, after this, I'm going to spend a little bit more time with my pointed pencil, and I'm going to come in here just like we did with our um, scallop and just get 
pull some of these little lines out here where it really, really counts, just like this. And I'm gonna, it's like adding on top of what we've already built. So it's, it's a nice way to really feel accomplishment, to enjoy the finished product. Just to enjoy the little textures and little moments that may have gotten overlooked. Okay. So there you have it. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to steal the camera back to me now. And I'd like to tell you a little bit more about what you can do with the things you learned in class today. So here we have our fishy friend. All right. So now that you've got this down, it's up to you to keep the ball rolling. And the best way you can do this is to practice, 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 right? It's also a good idea to keep yourself accountable. And I think the best way that I've improved as an artist is by teaching. And there are a lot of really interesting things you can learn on your own, and that's a really great achievement. But if you really wanna get a deeper, more robust understanding of your different areas of interest, like let's say for example, you are a marine biologist and you wanna use art to kind of convey the work that you're doing to other people, it could be a really good thing to help you teach what you're talking about to other folks. And uh, for example, if you're more of a hiker or a camper, bring a family member or a friend along and, and kind of you know, show them what you do with your sketchbook or your nature journal and bring that those joyful moments of discovery to them through that way. And same thing, if, if you know somebody who's more knowledgeable about certain subjects than you, make sure that you spend a little bit more time with them and help have them help you develop as either a naturalist, an artist, uh, or, or just somebody who's interested. Um, I always find that local community events are a great way to find things to draw and also to uh, get involved. So uh, for example, local nature centers or public libraries usually have programs that are um, nature centric. Uh, I find that practicing drawing in botanical gardens or in parks are some of the best places to go because if you have a centralized location, you go back to that location over and over and over again, you'll have more of an understanding of the things in that location and you'll kind of become like a little bit of an expert of that little area. Um, you know, also different online events just like this one. This is a great way to, for us to spend our time together and we're learning, we're being constructive. So um, another thing, I love to make gifts out of the things I draw. Uh, in this picture, you know, I, I, I gave this to my mom for, uh, for a card one holiday. Um, I also am a big fan of uh, sharing work, giving people my work and, and framing things like that. Um, over time, you're gonna have so many drawings, you don't know what to do with them. So you can even make calendars, a little field books or things like that too. Uh, if you're interested, I'd like to formally invite you to join our community on Facebook. Um, so this is a great place to share the drawings that you do. We have people and artists from around the world that post not only their drawings, but also uh, photos from their hikes, things that are all on theme with what we did here today. And it's a really great community of people. We have over 200 members and uh, it just continues to grow. And I hope you consider joining us. That's uh, facebook.com slash groups slash hike and draw. So if you enjoyed this workshop, good news, we have more workshops um, that are available for purchase. So these are recordings that we've uh, basically cultivated into an archive. You can find those at hikeanddraw.nyc, which is our website. And you can either purchase them a la carte, one at a time, or if you really, really love the experience, you can join and become a member and access all of the recordings all at once and watch them over and over and over again. Each workshop has downloadable resources. Each workshop has a different technique or, or reinforcing the same techniques that we've done today. And we cover a variety of subjects. So I, I encourage you to explore that website. Uh, again, that's hikeanddraw.nyc. For those of you who are more scientifically inclined, these are some really great resources for you to take out onto the field and some of them fit right on your phone. So we have some really cool apps that you can use to help identify plants and other different things that you might notice so that while you're doing your nature object drawings, you might actually find some more facts that you can write down. Uh, I also have a list of recommended books that you can go ahead and look at at your leisure. All of this I'm gonna be sending to you at the end of class. And I just wanna say, 
I know it's a Saturday. I know everybody has been in front of a computer all week working. I just really appreciate you coming out and drawing with me today. It's always a pleasure to see you. I, I love getting to see the same people on an almost weekly basis. And uh, if you enjoyed it, feel free to pass this along. Also feel free to leave a little tip if that's what you're into. And um, I hope you all come back again. I'd love to draw with you. I'd love to teach you. And I'd love to continue exploring with you. So thank you all so much. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thank you.